pleasure to see you again. <laughs> My pleasure. And um, I'm hearing an awful lot about Martin Luther. I went down to the seminary here in Philadelphia, and there was his book promptly displayed. I went to uh, Washington, D.C. on one of the life marches, and in their little bookstore, uh, the amount of conception, there was, there were, I'm sorry, pictures of Martin Luther. Little halo in the back. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I kind of think that uh, someone's trying to move us into thinking that Martin Luther should be a, a saint of the Catholic Church. Uh -huh. Uh, I have read a little bit about Martin Luther from the Protestant angle. Mm -hmm. And of course they say that he was trying to show that the church was in error and uh, sort of morally bankrupt when it came to taking money. And he was really silenced by the church so he couldn't get his information out. Um, was he a holy man, Father? <laughs> That's about the last thing you could ever say about a man. Sometimes, even in a criminal, you will find the spark of holiness. Not in Martin Luther, you will see. Well, uh, in 1974, they tried for the first time to start some uh, movement going on for the canonization of uh, the Große Herr Dr. Martin Luther. Let me tell you a few things about the man. Well, uh, before I start to talk about uh, the subject in question, I want you to remind—I want to remind you uh, to get ten books, facts about Luther. I forgot who wrote the book. It was written in 1916, and uh, ten books have the book. It's called Facts About Luther. That's the book in which you will also find footnotes to what I'm saying right now. I don't have the memory uh, for all the quotations needed to prove what I'm saying. But uh, in uh, Facts About Luther, or sometimes even in Protestant descriptions of Martin Luther, you will find the necessary footnotes to prove what I say. One of the most important would be if you have access to German libraries, maybe through that uh, funny new thing they call internet, uh, to study the Weimarer Tischgespräche, the table talks of Weimar of uh, Martin Luther. Let's get first through a little bit of uh, maybe somewhat boring uh, biographical detail. The man was born in uh, 1483 and uh, had a pretty rough uh, youth because uh, it was the kind of, of time and area in Germany where in order to raise children you beat them up every day. They're not exactly the best foundation for a holy life, but uh, for what Martin Luther did later on, no excuse whatsoever. His father, however, uh, tried his absolute best as uh, to the point of uh, supporting his son with money and his uh, acquaintances and uh, relations to turn his son into a, a jurist, a lawyer, or a judge, or whatever he wanted. So I think it was by the time that Martin Luther was 17 or 18, we are talking about the year 1500-1501, he went to the University of uh, Weimar to study law, and he graduated a doctor of uh, philosophy because the law studies were always in the faculty of philosophy back then. There was no proper law faculty. That's how he became the Herr Doctor Martin Luther, as the Germans remember him. Uh, mind you, his name was originally uh, Luther, L-U-D-E-R, which is still used today in the German language to describe a somewhat less than honest woman. And interesting uh, that he grew up with that name, but uh, he later on changed it. He Latinized it, and uh, the uh, the name Luther became Lutherus with a th instead of d. And then something happened, which uh, I guess happens with uh, some of the worst people in history. 
at a certain moment, I cannot in any way prove that it would be a direct influence of the devil, or indirect, indirect at least. He decided to abandon his law career and to make himself a friar. When Christ said, uh, I chose you, you didn't choose me, he, no, nobody ever in recorded history of Martin Luther told him to become a monk. His father explicitly wanted him to become a lawyer or a judge. Nobody ever told him, uh, you should be a friar. There are several stories about what moved him to that step. Uh, he himself claims that uh, he was saved miraculously in a thunderstorm. A uh, flashlight hit the tree next to where he was walking. The tree split and nothing happened to him. And he said, oh my God, I have to become a monk. Which is usually what you call a less than rational decision. At uh, the same time, there's a story of some murder going on, also about his father. Uh, there is uh, enough uh, uh, evidence that his father was a murderer and for that reason had to change his uh, life position. He had to leave the original town, I forgot where it was, somewhere in Thuringia, and move over to where Martin Luther was born in Eisleben. And, uh, but the point is, at that moment when uh, he was, as he claims, miraculously saved from a flashlight and a thunderstorm, uh, he decided to become a monk. He was never chosen. Nobody ever told him. He said, I will be a monk. Later on, he claimed that he forcefully was pushed into the monkhood. So he applied with the local Augustinian monastery and became a novice. A novice, to become a novice in the monastery means you're under no obligation whatsoever to stay in the monastery. Anytime you're kind of fed up with it, anytime you feel like you can't go on living this life, you can without sin, without punishment, without any bad consequence to your state of life, leave the monastery again. At this point, yeah. he, he was a, a lawyer, he was not a religious at this point. Mm -hmm. So he becomes a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Now he decides he wants to become a religious or a monk. Right. Is that correct? And it was his own decision. Uh, it never happened, according to recorded history, that anyone would have told him, you should really become a priest or you should really be in a monastery, which is very often a sign of vocation. Long before I wanted to become a priest, uh, Another priest in Rome, of all places, told me, uh, you should become a priest. I didn't realize at the time that it was a kind of vocation, but you always get this. You either have the, uh, the constant urge uh, to celebrate Mass. When I was five years old, I celebrated, quote, unquote, like children do, I celebrated Mass. There was no uh, hint whatsoever to a vocation in Martin Luther. But Martin Luther was a sort of level-headed and very stubborn character. Once he had decided, I'm going to be a monk, he would do everything, move everything, just to become a monk. So he went through the novitiate, and uh, if I remember well, it was in 1510 that he celebrated his first Mass. No, sorry, in 1502 he celebrated his first Mass. He was known in the monastery for being a, a very strict monk. And here we come to an, a very, very important point that's bothering religious life today, even within tradition. He was, from the outstart of becoming a monk, from the very moment he had done his perpetual vows that make him a monk forever, from the very moment he celebrated his first mass and he had to undergo the rigors of religious life, fasting, penitence, the, the strict rule of the order, every hour of the day regulated. You have to show up for prime, terse, sex, known, all the parts of the breviary uh, sung in common in choir, which especially with the Augustinian uh, monasteries is uh, the main tradition. When you think of Augustinian monasteries, your first uh, association should be an association with uh, strict and traditional liturgy. So he could never claim that this was something uh, strange or new to him. 
he had gone all through the novitiate with a beautiful Latin mass and the Latin breviary, the same, the very same breviary I'm reciting every day because the secular clergy for many centuries already is reciting the uh, Augustinian breviary. And uh, so he celebrated his first mass and then he became known as a scrupulant. He was very scrupulous. Now scruples, I beg your pardon for giving you my definition of scruples. Scruples is the sort of, of uh, moody, uh, gloomy thinking that you will undergo once your conscience is not in the right place anymore. When your conscience is not in the right place anymore, the devil will substitute your conscience with scruples. Instead of fighting the real sin, you will create your own type of sin that you have to fight. That means instead of pursuing to live wholly according to the rules of the order and the Ten Commandments, you will look and go into the details. You will get stuck with the details, hung up with the details. And instead of fighting your sins, you will only fight those minor things which is very often serious too, but in no way to com be compared with, let's say, mortal sin. And he was known as a scrupulant. Uh, no penance was uh, bad enough for him. No fasting was strict enough for him. And the result was, this is very important to understand, people who allow scruples to grow and bloom in themselves will damage their own conscience. They will destroy their own conscience with time passing. Because if you base your life instead of the rules of life, be it in the monastery, the rules of the monastery, be it in a family, the rules of papal teaching on family life, on the duties of uh, a family father or a mother or children, and if you base your attention, if you focus your attention instead of focusing it on the real sins against the Ten Commandments, the real breach of one of the commandments. You focus it on too much on details, then you become a scrupulant. It is the scrupulants that, as you very well know, that always tell me Father S. must not drink wine. They blaspheme Christ. He drank wine every day. He not only drank wine, his first miracle was to make wine. No, Martin Luther would not have it. I'm a monk, I'm never allowed to do that. When he fasted, he fasted to the point of excessive pain. When he made penance, he made penance, he did penance to the, to the point of excessive pain. Very few people are called to live that life. Saint Teresa of Avila, whom I consider most probably the, the greatest female mystic in church history said leave these things to the saints you have to be called to do this however Martin Luther who never was called to the priesthood who called himself to the priesthood who called himself to the religious state of life called himself to penance excessive penance the effect was he got caught up in all kinds of activities penance will take time Fasting even will take time. You think it takes time eating, uh, start to fast, fast rigorously, and still try to do your duties. Monks have to do manual labor too. And a Carthusian friend of mine told me that uh, once uh, uh, Lent is over, they're not allowed to any kind of uh, uh, meat, eggs, fish, or cheese in Lent. And he says by the time it's Holy Week, he's hardly able to cut his own firewood anymore. So it takes time. And the result was almost, I would say, logical, almost a necessary result of being a scrupulant, overdoing your religious duties. He ended up by not saying the bravery. He'd be so much involved in this or that and other things, whatever it was, like saying Mass in the parish, preaching a two-hour sermon, uh, dealing with people who were asking questions. He got so busy with everything that he had, quote unquote, no time anymore for the breviary. 
The result was Martin Luther would say the breviary, for example, he would shut up himself on Saturday, shut himself up in the cell, and say the breviary of the past week, on Monday. Say on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, the whole breviary, including Sunday, the next day. And then he would go on with his, whatever he thought was his duties. Here is one of the most important characteristics of Martin Luther. He was incredibly proud. He was determined to know everything without help. He was the one who knew what he had to do, not his superiors. He needed to tell himself what penance to do, not his superiors. He was the one who would decide when to fast as hard as can be, not his superiors. So from the outstart, from the moment he had said his first mass, and from the moment he had done his vows, he was, in a way, disobedient. He was disobedient in the sense that he would not ask his superior. He would not ask the prior or the spiritual director. They had no such thing, but a similar thing in those days. He would not ask his confessor. He would be the one. Like he decided to become a monk, he would decide that he needed to do this penance or that penance and that much of penance or that little of penance. He was the one who would decide. Don't forget that original sin was a result of Eve deciding to try the famous apple. Eve went into what Paul VI wanted all of us to do, into dialogue. Eve went into dialogue with the snake. And Eve started to uh, decide on her own. When the Bible says that a Lucifer wanted to be like God, this is to be understood in the following sense. Literally, he wanted to be God, yes. But of course, the most intelligent being ever created by God was not uh, stupid enough to think that he really could be God. So Lucifer knew perfectly well, with the perfection of a pure spirit, that he could not be God. What does it mean when, it, when the Bible says he wanted to be like God? He wanted to be what he was without God. He wanted to be what he was and what he still is because of himself. He was the one who was going to decide what he was, how he was, and what he was going to do. The prophet Jeremiah quotes it, and he says, Non serviam, I will not serve. Instead of saying, Agimus tibi gratios omnipotens Deus, we give you thanks, Almighty God. He didn't want to thank God in all eternity. He didn't want to depend on gratitude for the rest of his existence. He didn't want to depend on humility for the rest of his existence. That was exactly the root of all evil in Luther. He decided, I am going to be a monk. He decided, I'm going to be an Augustinian. He decided, I'm going to celebrate Mass, cost, cost it whatever it costs. He decided what penance he's going to do, when, where, and how. And he decided what was right and what was wrong. The result was inevitable. He, uh, contrary to what they usually tell you about uh, the history of the Herr Dr. Martin Luther, he was not at all scandalized of Rome. In 1510, he was sent to Rome on some errand by his superiors. He went to Rome, and in his own accounts, like the uh, Weimarer Tischgespräche that I already quoted, table talks, the famous Luther table talks, in his own accounts he said, I didn't find anything uh, first. Later on he, he said something different. But first he said uh, he thoroughly enjoyed his visit to Rome. It did good to him. It was good for his spiritual life. It was good for his faith. His faith as much as there was faith, grew when he was in Rome. He was not at all scandalized by the uh, Renaissance popes, who have been painted much worse than they were. They were very bad. They were very bad in many different ways of what we think they were, like uh, Alexander VI, for example, and Martin V. They got involved with Kabbalistic studies. That's not what I call very uh, popish. Uh, it's not 
what I call uh, the right thing for the Vicar of Christ to get involved with Kabbalistic studies, but they did. But Martin Luther couldn't know that at the time. What he saw was a pretty rough city that was kept under control by more or less holy priests, priests at least who still lived under a rule and under a discipline, and of course who had daily mass, breviary, and rosary. And uh, he was very much enchanted by his visit in Rome. And as a matter of fact, when he came back a couple of months later, there was not one bad word of his about Rome. He would later on claim that Rome scandalized him to the, uh, to the point of uh, destroying his faith. At the time, this was not true. Then there was another secret, dark, very, very dark spot in Martin Luther. Martin Luther was, as we know, very temperamental, quite temperamental. He was short-tempered. He would have uh, fits of anger. And like many vivacious people at that time, he had a deep, deep problem with the Sixth Commandment. A very deep problem. He fought it originally when he was doing his rigorous penance instead of listening to his superiors and doing the right thing that you always do when you're in the state of priesthood or when you're in a monastery or even as a father of a family. You'll always need your spiritual director. You will need your confessor. You will need uh, your advisors. You will need uh, priests that help you overcome all vices, all temptations. Again, Martin Luther knew best what to do, and the result was he totally and utterly failed. He was absolutely not capable of getting rid of certain horrible things against the Sixth Commandment. That deeply bothered him, much less in the sense of the deep sense of, of, of guilt in offending God, but it sort of drove him crazy not to be able to dominate the vice. Proud as he was, to him it was more important to dominate the vice rather than to be the humble sinner. And there was the first spark of heresy in him when he started to think and soon, later on, to say that we are not capable of dominating our vices. Not capable. The Protestant Reformation, that's something that has to be understood, did not start, and I will go into this, the Protestant Reformation did not start with indulgences. It did not start with uh, wic wicked popes in the Renaissance Rome. It did not start with the corruption of the church. It started with one man who was admittedly incapable of dominating his vices. He went into something that is all too common in the 20th and now in the 21st century. He went into despair. Hope means, what does hope mean? Hope means I want to go to heaven. I cannot do it alone. I need Christ, who said, without me you can do nothing. And my hope is that I will make it as long as I try my best and as long as I try hard to be worthy. Despair means no matter what I do, I have absolutely no way to succeed. That's the explanation for all the suicides in our days. That's the explanation for all the uh, terrible destruction in family life and in religious life nowadays. He realized that he had a real cause to fight for, his own vices, his own pride, his own temper, his own lust, his own obscenity. 
he realized he had to fight it with all his force. He did not realize that you cannot do it without spiritual guidance. He was very convinced, very much convinced, that he would be the remedy to his own problems. If he had listened to superiors, if he had read the right books, he was not as learned as you think in theology. Of course, the Augustinians made him study theology before they made him a monk. But uh, we have reports, and he himself admits it on another occasion, uh, that his uh, knowledge in theology was anything but profound. Again, he was satisfied of being the her doctor in law. He was satisfied with that, and he did not go in too deeply into the studies. I will have to come back to that point, start, uh, speaking about Luther and the Bible. Again, he did not trust his superiors, spiritual directors, spiritual guiders. He himself was convinced he would be his own remedy. Necessarily, in that case, he failed. He was not able to dominate his vice, and that drove him into despair. And in his despair, he came to the f firm conviction, I cannot do it. What, do, what, does, what does someone do who realizes, now realizes that uh, the way he is acting, the way he is deciding, he will not be able to dominate something? What do you do if you don't reach the ideal? Either you convert, you ask for help, not professional help in the United States, but I'm talking about real help, spiritual help. Or you lower the ideal. As Chesterton says, the most horrible thing one can do when he's not capable of reaching the ideal is lowering the ideal. Lower the standard, so sort of, I lower the standard and I will be up to it. That's what he did. That was one of the roots of the Reformation. The other route was his studies. I mentioned his theological uh, education. He did not uh, go into deeply into moral theology. He was not the kind of, uh, he was never brilliant, mind you, not even his uh, law studies. He was not brilliant. He was pretty good, but he was not brilliant. Now, St. Thomas Aquinas being, first of all, brilliant, second, simple, third, extremely logical, common sense. Common sense is what dominates the so-called Thomistic, I hate the word, the so-called Thomistic thinking. It's not Thomistic, it's all common sense. Martin Luther, like many Germans, had a problem with common sense and he didn't understand St. Thomas. He, he didn't bother anymore. Typical Martin Luther. He did not, uh, he did not understand St. Thomas very well, so he stopped studying him. He went into the Bible, he grabbed the Old Testament. His superiors told him and said, what's the matter with you, Brother Martin? You're always reading the Bible. You're reading the Bible, reading the Bible, and reading the Bible. Sounds familiar. Reading the Bible. He was a Bible beater long before there was Protestantism. He had a problem. He didn't know the answer. Instead of grabbing St. Thomas, he grabbed the Bible. He wanted to do spiritual reading instead of reading Thomas Akempis, Imitation of Christ, instead of reading St. Augustine. He, he, he intensely hated St. Augustine later on because he didn't understand him. Instead of reading St. Augustine, it was all in his breviary, which he said Saturday for one week. Instead of, of reading in the breviary St. Ambrose, St. Chrysostomus, St. Chrysologus, St. Augustine, St. Gregory the Great, he went back to the Bible, he studied the Bible, and the Bible, and the Bible alone. So you can see the roots of his thinking already being there. He can't dominate his vice, later on he will say, live your vice. He can't understand the church fathers, later on he will call them unspeakable names. Even when his superiors told him, it is wrong for you, Brother Martin, always to read the Bible and only read the Bible. Later on, he would go on and say, Suficit, Biblia. The Bible suffices. You don't need anything but the Bible. It was everything that we know from the Reformation 
was there long before there was ever the famous case of Tetzel and the indulgences in Germany. Now, you have to understand what happened. In 1503, Pope Alexander VI, who is all too infamous in church history, even though he never touched the faith or liturgy in his uh, miserable career, he had a miserable career because uh, it is not very nice for a pope to have children when he is a pope. And uh, uh, Alexander VI was a thoroughly vicious man as far as his own lifestyle was concerned, as far as the, the, uh, uh, the goings on with his Spanish Borja, later on in, in Italy, Borgia family was concerned. The point we have to understand nowadays is that contrary to some 20th century popes, uh, Alexander VI led a horrible life, but he never touched the doctrine or Holy Mass. He never claimed to know better than tradition. And that's one of the reasons why when in 1510 Martin Luther went to Rome, as I said, he was not at all scandalized. There was, in 1510, Pope Alexander VI was dead seven years. The great Pope Julius II, who was not exactly leading a moral life before he became Pope, but who reversed his ways once he was Pope and led a very virtuous and good life once he was Pope. Julius II was Pope seven years in 1510, when Luther came to Rome. Now, in 1503, Julius II was elected to the papacy with bribery. The moment he got elected, simony you call it, the moment he got elected, he published a law against simony. Because he was scandalized himself. I mean, he didn't say no, but uh, he was scandalized. And uh, he rightly believed that after Alexander VI was dead, even he could be much better than that one. And he was. Now, by the time the Renaissance popes were in the greatest glory, quote-unquote, we're talking about the year 1500, the old Basilica of St. Peter's, founded by Constantine the Great, was pretty much in shambles. It was falling apart, literally, literally falling apart. Entire side chapels had to be closed because of uh, rocks coming down. Parts of the ceiling would be coming down. Ornaments would be coming down. Very dangerous place to go in, in the year 1500. And Julius II, who was not exactly what you call a man of very modest decisions, said, okay, I'm going to tear down the old basilica and build a new one. He got uh, one of the greatest geniuses as far as architecture is concerned, mind you, of his time, Michelangelo, to start off with the new basilica. He soon, not immediately, that's important for our story. He soon started to realize that uh, the funds of the church available in Rome would never suffice to build that new church. You have to understand, if you have ever seen St. Peter's Basilica, uh, for those who have never been in Rome, try to look at a picture that shows you Saint, the back side of St. Peter's Basilica. A picture taken in the Vatican Gardens showing you the back side of the basilica. This is more or less what Michelangelo wanted the building to look like. He wanted it built on the foundation of a Greek, not a Latin, a Greek cross, the uh, fully symmetrical cross. And if he had done that, the basilica all around would have looked like it looks in the back now, more or less. Still, uh, smaller than what we have now, and yet uh, incredibly expensive. We, there is no way really to compute nowadays, dollar-wise, what something like St. Peter's uh, cost at the time. It was immense. Now the church, of course, has never, so far, nowadays everything's possible in Rome, but so far the church has never sold indulgences because that's against the doctrine of the church. If you buy an indulgence, the indulgence is invalid. I'll come back to that. Pope Julius II decided, late in his life, we're talking about after 1510, when Luther was back in Germany, 
no talk about uh, uh, scam being scandalized in Rome anymore. Julius II decided to uh, get some money for that basilica through donations giving, given for almonds, you call that, donations given for receiving indulgences. That is not selling indulgence because the point was this, first of all, what is an indulgence? The doctrine of the church says it very clearly. Indulgence and indulgence will neither substitute for confession, nor for absolution, nor for contrition. As a matter of fact, the rules of the church have always laid down that in order to receive an indulgence, be it a partial or a plenary indulgence, in order to be able to receive that, you first have to feel sorry for your sins, attrition or contrition. Contrition being the perfect, uh, being sorry, quote unquote, being sorry for your sins. The perfect remorse. Perfect remorse means you're not sorry for your sins only because you're afraid of hell, but you're sorry for your sins because they offend Christ. You feel sorry for Christ much more than for yourself. That's a plenary, that's a real uh, contrition, real uh, remorse. Now the first thing is you have to have attrition or contrition, otherwise confession would be invalid. You go to confession uh, with the intention of committing the same sin again, you know very well, uh, the absolution is invalid. Second condition, you have to go to confession. Third condition, you have to do something in order to receive the indulgence. Now contrary to what uh, the most generous Pope Pius IX gave us, a short little prayer which you find in the back of the missal where the picture of the crucifix is next to it, in order to receive a plenary indulgence, in those days, that was a complicated thing. For example, in order to receive a plenary indulgence in, Saint P uh, in Rome during the Holy Year, it was not sufficient just to cross back and forth the Holy Gate to the Basilica. That's only open in the Holy Year. No, you had to visit seven churches. That's the tradition of the seven basilicas in Rome, the four major basilicas and the three minor. The same condition was laid down in writing and preaching in Germany when that indulgence later on under Pope Leo X was published in Germany. The conditions were, first, that was the conditions that were valid for everyone. Attrition and contrition, confession, and then visit seven churches. Usually the bishop would assign the seven churches, which ones were the seven churches you had to visit. Saying prayers for the forgiveness of your sins, that would be the major condition in order to receive an indulgence. And then you had to give an offering. Like... Uh, Today, uh, some people will viciously tell you that you pay a mass uh, at the mass a priest is saying. That's not true. Of course, the dioceses make sure there's a certain amount, minimum amount, because otherwise I'm faced with people who give me one dollar and ask me to say mass, and another one would give me fifty dollars. And uh, on the day I say mass for one dollar, I miss uh, the forty-nine dollars that I get next day. Of course, so in order to avoid abuse, even donations have to be regulated. They were regulated. <coughs> Each person who wanted the indulgence had to give a donation according to his state of life. Unlike today where everybody has to pay taxes, no matter what, you uh, the sales tax. Sales tax is valid for the rich and the poor. You pay so and so many percent in Austria, it's 20 percent. Hi, America. In Austria, you pay 20% sales tax on everything. It doesn't matter if you're really poor or if you're filthy rich. You pay 20% sales tax, and that's it. Unthinkable in Catholic times. The rich would be expected to give a lot more, and the real poor people wouldn't give anything. They would get their plenary indulgence. They would, give, they would talk to the priest, and if they made it credible to the priest, of course, they, they really want indulgence. They're not going to lie about that. They say, Father, I can't. 
I don't have any money. The priest would dispense him and say, you can receive the plenary indulgence visiting the seven churches. That's not what you call selling something. In no dictionary you would call that selling something. In no moral theology, be it ancient or new, you would call that selling something. Now the point was, the church knew, out of experience, that first of all, the enemies of the church and also less intelligent people, let's put it this way, would misunderstand indulgence. The word indulgence and the meaning of indulgence. What, what is an indulgence? Now the point is, once uh, you go to confession, you are restored to the life of grace, of sacramental grace. However, the punishment due to the sin committed is not taken away. The sin is forgiven and sanctifying grace is restored in the penitent. But the punishment due to the sin is not taken away. If you, for example, if you commit murder and uh, you go to confession, you get absolution, it doesn't mean you, have to, you don't have to go to jail anymore. Of course not. Now the indulgence, and that's why in the old days you talked about, let's say, 300 days indulgence or five months indulgence or four years indulgence or plenary indulgence. What does that mean? It means that whatever the indulgence is requiring, if you do it, if you do it well and if you uh, rightly receive the indulgence, you will be forgiven not only your sin but the temporal punishment due to the sin, let's say a 400 day indulgence would be something like the punishment is reduced as if you had offered up 400 days of disease and suffering for the sins committed. Now indulgence means that this offering, whatever it is you have to give, will take away that punishment. A plenary indulgence therefore means all temporal punishment is taken away. Now the point of a partial indulgence is when they talk about, uh, uh, let's say, you do a certain offering, you say a certain prayer, you visit seven churches, and you get a partial indulgence, for example, of 400 days, as it used to be called in the old days. That is like as if you offered up the sufferings that will come with 400 days of suffering, let's say, of a disease. Which is, of course, temporal punishment. Nowadays, uh, many people dislike the very concept of calling a disease a temporal punishment. They don't understand that uh, sickness, disease, suffering is something that's, of course, not pleasing to God. It is something that He permits for our own good. And uh, if we want to receive a partial indulgence, we can offer it up. So 400 days partial indulgence is like as if you had offered up 400 days of suffering. The doctrine of the church on indulgences is something that at the time now, we're going back to 1510, 1513. Now in 1513, Pope Julius II died and Leo X, the Medici Pope, became Pope. He, of course, continued building St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, and he continued to uh, offer the uh, indulgences in order also to get money for that church. Why? Well, the point is, sometimes uh, you can hear an accusation made against Leo X telling him, well, if he wanted that wonderful church built, why didn't he uh, pay it out of his own pocket? Well, the point is, uh, first of all, no pope ever had that kind of money, contrary to what people make you believe. Second, uh, the accusation is groundless. Leo X didn't build that church for himself. When Julius II started to build the new St. Peter's Basilica, he knew that in his lifetime he wasn't going to see anything of it. Leo X when he started out as Pope, he knew he was never going to see that church finished. It wasn't for himself, it was for the entire Christendom. Something that, unfortunately, a concept that has been lost nowadays, to consider a church being public property. 
not in the sense that the public can go around and sell it, but in the sense that what is a church built for? A priest, in order to say mass and to fulfill his daily duty, doesn't need a church, not a big one at least. He needs a chapel, like cardinals, bishops, and me too. We have our private chapels. And that's all I need for being able to say mass. I do not need a big church, let alone St. Peter's. A church like St. Peter's, like all great basilicas in Rome, were built for the people, so the people can worship, and as everything in religion should be, it was first of all built for the greater glory of God. You, you weren't talking about some luxury the Pope was permitting himself. In order to finance that church, you have to get money somewhere. The, the Christian way of thinking was not to have everybody pay taxes for that. Nowadays, the president wants something, okay, invent a new tax, and he will get the money. That's not the Christian way of thinking. And that's why the offerings had to be proportional to your state of life and your income. The point now that concerns us with Martin Luther is, when, the German, when finally uh, the German bishops joined in this common effort of Christendom for the new basilica, they divided Germany in sort of three districts where the indulgences would be preached. We are concerned with the one that uh, is about to be found where you had the former German Democratic Republic and parts that are today Poland. That part of Germany was one of the three districts for preaching indulgences. The preacher that uh, later on got trouble with Martin Luther was a certain Dominican called Tetzel, T-E-T. Z E L. Tetzel was a very correct, very learned man who, contrary to Martin Luther, had really studied his St. Thomas, and he preached the indulgences absolutely according to the doctrine of the Church. As a matter of fact, there was, until Martin Luther started his business, very few problems with the indulgences. And the problems that arose were problems absolutely prototypical for all centuries in church history. Some priests would be, let's say, careless in their preaching. And of course, many faithful would be careless in their understanding of indulgences. You, it is true, you would have people running around telling you, oh, if you pay a few uh, dollars for the indulgence, then you can happily go on sinning as if an indulgence could ever take away the penance due to a future sin. Of course, the very thought is absurd and illogical. The Church in its uh, former pre-Vatican II logic would have never been, uh, let's put it plainly, never been silly enough to preach something like a prepaid uh, indulgence for a future sin. That's it's preposterous. And very few people seriously believed it. For Martin Luther, it was only an excuse. By the time the indulgences were preached in Germany, not yet contradicted by Martin Luther at all, he had long decided that he was not capable of living his up to his vows. With now his discipline lacking more and more, with his... Uh, religious life lacking more and more, with his becoming constantly more sinful, with his falling into despair over his own sins. Long before he was a real Protestant, he said that uh, he, will go, he would go to hell because he would never be able to dominate his vices. The despair moved him to lower the ideals. And he started to preach the new doctrine the new doctrine not yet talking about indulgences at all. The new doctrine not yet talking about a corrupt Renaissance, uh, lusty Rome yet. He will just preach and say, you cannot get rid of your vices by doing penance. You cannot get rid of them by praying. You cannot get rid of them by doing good works. You cannot get rid of them. There is no human way of getting rid of your vices. 
Therefore, it can't be true what the church teaches about penance, what the church teaches about discipline, what the church, church teaches about confession, and what the church teaches about, and there we are, indulgences. There is no way to get rid of your vices. You are stuck in them. There is no way of improving your life. You are condemned to be a sinner. Of course, his superiors were appalled when they heard about it. And uh, they told him, told him, said, you cannot say these things in public, let alone on the pulpit. He went on, proud as he was, again, he did not heed the advice. He did not obey his superiors. He went on and on. Now, in 1517, finally it happened. The famous publication of the thesis, the 95 Thesis of Luther, at the Schlosskirche zu Wittenberg. I don't know what is all the fuzz about those 95 Theses. In those days, it was more than common to nail a piece of paper with certain theological theses on your church door in order to, uh, uh, to provoke a theological discussion and to get into an academic dispute, dispute about something. There was no uh, computer, there was no telephone, and there was very, very little of, of printing yet. So if somebody had a new theological theory, instead of just affirming his own errors, he would uh, write them clearly legibly on a piece of paper, nail that piece of paper to the next church door, and hope that somebody would come along and say, hey, what's the matter with you? And so they would get into uh, a serious and uh, interesting theological discussion, not having a telephone. They would just, after Mass, for example, get together and discuss theology, which is a good thing. So for the moment, there was nothing special in uh, the Dr. Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the church door. The problem was what it said on that paper. First of all, most Protestant authors will confirm that the 95 Theses were incoherent, lousy theology, illogical, and some of them plain polemics. The result was that uh, the superiors told Martin Luther to take back these theses and to abandon the whole issue. That's not the way you talk to her, to the, her doctor Martin Luther. He went on raging. Now he not only defended these theses, now he went much further. So to cut a long story short, the whole thing was carried to Rome and Pope Leo X wrote a document in which he condemned the 95 Theses of Luther. Most of them uh, quoting the Theses, most, most of them were condemned by quoting the Theses and adding what the Church says about it. Martin Luther was a heretic long for, before, 19, before 1517, as we have seen. Now he became a public heretic. And now, having separated himself from the Church, now having gone into rebellion against the church, now having publicly disobeyed his superiors, the rest was the avalanche that had to follow. Can I interject here, Father? Yeah. In my reading, the issue seemed to come down to this. Martin Luther had the right to post his thesis. Yeah. The church, if the church disagreed with that, yeah, they would have to take him uh, to a court or tribunal and and show that these were incorrect. No, it was sufficient for his superiors uh, not to allow the publication of these theses. Don't forget, Martin Luther was an Augustinian monk. It was not even a secular priest who still has a superior called bishop. Uh, of course, you could not publish any kind of thing there. When we talk about a thesis published, we're talking about what today is called a thesis. 
on some issue that has not yet been settled in the church, you can always literally write a thesis and get your doctorate for that. I got my doctorate in theology for writing the following thesis. I stated that Gilbert Keith Chesterton was not only writing about theology, but that Gilbert Keith Chesterton was a theologian and a Thomistic <laughs> theologian as such. That was my thesis. I proved my point and got the doctorate. So you're saying to me, Father, this, that Luther had no, Luther did not have a right to be judged whether he was correct or incorrect by the church. He was asking them to show where he, his thesis were wrong. No, the point is that first of all he published his thesis without asking his superiors. In a monastery that was never possible. I couldn't publish my thesis without asking my superiors. I mean, that's just the rules of the university. You don't just write a thesis and nail it to a door. Well, today it means you go to the printer. The, the point is, first of all, you have to have the theological discussion. So what you could do was, with the agreement of your superiors, you uh, propose your theological opinion on something where theological opinions are still possible. You cannot, you cannot uh, uh, for example, publish a thesis against the, the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. That's why it is a dogma. So in order you do not theologically discuss it anymore. But indulgences are not that. Uh, say again? Indulgences are not on that category. Uh, no, they're not on the category of the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, but... Uh, he yet. feels, Luther, Luther now, my, my reading, Luther feels that they are buying, they're only doing indulgence to get money. Yeah. They, but, have, uh, they, yeah. Ha they have given that, yeah. they have given that, um, well, they have given that, that job to a certain bishop, yeah. and his job yeah. was to get yeah. the money. Yeah. But Luther point, says that's wrong. Yeah, but the point of the 95 Thesis that he published was, first of all, uh, by far uh, not uh, the indulgences in the first place. Second, uh, when you bother to, to read those 95 Theses, you will find that he just attacks the Pope uh, in, in, in a way that would never be theologically permitted, in the sense of a theological discussion. What has that got to do with a theological discussion if you publish a thesis? Oh, you're saying, Father, that there are, there are many more things than indulgences oh, yes, of course. that he proposed of there. Of course, of course. That's, what, that's, that's why I said the indulgences were one point only. Okay. Yeah. The point is, for example, he, he just said, if that pope there in Rome wants that church built, why doesn't he pay it out of his own pocket? Okay, you might as well ask that question, but that's not a theological th thesis to be nailed to the Schlosskirche door of Wittenberg. That's unacceptable, and it was unacceptable, and it is unacceptable. However, uh, once, once uh, the 95 theses were published, uh, with the help of uh, many enemies of the church, these uh, theses were widespread widespread. There was hardly uh, any learned men left in Europe who wouldn't have heard about those theses. Now, Europe at the time was still Catholic, and uh, you can imagine that the vast majority of people just rejected these things and said, ah, just another crackpot, don't pay attention. Needless to say, politics are uh, something very ancient. But Europe was not yet ready for that. The 95 Theses were published, and as I said, Leo the, Leo the Pope Leo X uh, made it clear what the Church had to say about them. He condemned all 95 Theses, said unacceptable Church doctrine. Usually, that would settle the cause. Roma locuta causa finita. Once Rome has spoken, the case has ended. Before we start to understand how the Reformation could ever be successful, because in 1517 nobody would have dreamed of that monk becoming famous, we have to see what uh, Luther went on to do. 
Now, by the time he had realized that he could not possibly control his vices, mainly being the one against the Sixth Commandment, he was long decided uh, to find himself a woman. That was something entirely traditional with him, because uh, before he became a monk already, he tried to uh, uh, propose. When he was a monk, he complained about his uh, uh, still unsatisfied sexual desires. Once he had decided in his mind that it is impossible for a human being to fight vices, he decided to do what he later on made a commandment of his own, go on sinning and go and sin boldly. And he did. First of all, he indulged in uh, the vice against the Sixth Commandment, for which no man needs anybody else, unfortunately. There is temporary documents proving, without any scientific doubt, that he was constantly indulgent in that. Once uh, in the, uh, let's say, constant state of mortal sin, he realized that it was perfectly absurd for him to go to confession because he'd commit the sin the same day. So he, he ceased to go to confession, and of course, in order to uh, tranquilize his long ago uh, squandered and uh, smashed conscience, he declared, fresh and proud as he was, he declared that confession is perf perfectly superfluous. As it is impossible for man to uh, win against sin, there's also no purpose in confession. Once he was loosened to the point that he would abandon the sacraments, not go to confession anymore, not go to communion, it was an automatic consequence that he soon would uh, cease to say Mass, and on the point of Holy Mass. This heresy was again not new with him. Because already in his theological studies he had not taken St. Thomas Aquinas serious enough, and because he uh, indulged too much in the reading of the Bible, long before he became the rebel, and long before he abandoned his priestly duties, he had grave problems in understanding Mass. You see, the danger in reading the Bible is now, the Bible is the Word of God, of course. The Old Testament is inspired by God, and the New Testament is inspired by God. The greatest treasure in the Catholic Church is the fact that we do not just have the Bible. We have tradition. And the Council of Trent, which is also quoted in Vatican I, defines tradition. I made once a whole conference on this subject, which I recommend to study for that point. The whole point of tradition is, uh, as defined in Trent and Vatican I, Tradition is what we receive from Christ, what has been revealed, either written down in the Gospel and the Old Testament, in the approved books of the Bible, or which has been handed down in church tradition. Everything that the apostles heard out of the very mouth of Christ. Tradition, according to tradition, ended with uh, the death of the last apostle, which was St. John the Evangelist. Without tradition, the Bible is nothing. Not because the Word of God would be nothing, but because the very same God who inspired the writers of the Old Testament and the New Testament, that very same God said to Peter, Tu es Petrus et superhang Petram edificabo ecclesia meam. Thou art Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. With this, he gave the church tradition. With the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, that tradition was explained to the apostles in one moment of light. With that tradition handed down faithfully from pope to pope, from the church fathers, the popes, the councils, and in the church teaching, only this way we can understand the Bible. There is a reason why until a few centuries ago, Catholics were not allowed to read the Bible without permission. Why? Example. 
in the Old Testament there are many things where the New Testament will say something different. An eye for an eye, Christ said no. He said, love thy enemy. Does that mean we have to associate with our enemies? No. It means the moment you realize somebody is your enemy, you've got to pray for him. Not curse him, but pray for him. That would be a conference on its own, just <laughs> the Sermon on the Mount itself. But the point is, if you read the Bible without guidance, you will make up your own religion which is exactly what happened. Luther said, there is nothing in the Bible about the sacraments. It's true, Christ never said baptism is a sacrament. He said, go in all the world and baptize the people, all the peoples in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He didn't say that was a sacrament. When at Cana, Christ made wine, he didn't say wedding, the holy sacrament of marriage is a sacrament. He was present at a wedding and he consecrated water and turned it into wine, which is a miracle. But he didn't say uh, Catholics ought to be married in the sacrament of marriage, a matrimony, excuse me. There is nothing in the Bible on the point of the sacrament of confession. Where do we get this? It doesn't say in the New Testament that there are seven sacraments. The Council of Trent says there are seven sacraments. See, this is the point I'm making. The Bible is the Holy Word of God. Don't forget that there is a special liturgy in a solemn high mass just for reading the gospel. When the deacon and the subdeacon process, the priest is standing at the altar, the deacon is singing the gospel, the subdeacon is holding the gospel. Such a special rite just for reading a little bit of writing shows you that we are talking about Christ himself, the Word of God. But when you read the Word of God, which was not written for the everyday man out there, it was written in, as a part of God's revelation. We wouldn't need a Pope, we wouldn't need the Vicar of Christ, we wouldn't need the Holy Spirit, we wouldn't need the inspiration given to the Pope on the very, very, very few occasions he uses his infallibility. If we could just under, be enlightened by reading the Bible. You can be totally led into error if you read Holy Scripture without guidance. Many things in there can easily be misunderstood. Just think of uh, when Christ in the Gospel says, if you do not hate your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your children, you're not worthy of me. Does that mean if I want to be worthy of Christ I have to hate my mother? Of course not. And yet you could claim, excuse me, is this the word of our Lord or isn't it? See what I mean? Now, it would be part of a sermon to explain this whole thing now. We don't have the time to go into uh, exegesis of the New Testament. But just to give you one example on how confusing it can be. Now, Martin Luther, being uh, erudite in a single-minded way, would easily be misled to a certain point. The tragedy with Luther is he was not just misled, but he started to lie. It has been said that Martin Luther is the father of the German language and that he translated the Bible into German. Not true. By the time Luther started his translation of the Bible, there were 17 translations circulating. German translations of the Bible. When Luther started to translate the Bible, he omitted whatever did not fit his purposes. He scratched out entire books, letters, of Holy Scripture. Whatever he translated and left in the Bible, he would either change or add comments or uh, leave out entire sentences or words. We have evidence from the judgments of uh, other Protestant writers like Calvin or Melanchthon, all these famous first generation Protestants, they will all agree on one point. The Martin Luther translation of the Bible is worthless. Back to the historic happenings. Luther now had decided to be the rebel in the church. And he started to show his real nature. So far, his real nature was somewhat 
known to his uh, Augustinian brothers. Some were known to the people who closer had closer association with him. Now it became public. Father, Father, I could stop you here. Are you saying that Luther jimmied the Bible up? subjectively to cover his own sins and shortcomings. Yes. I mentioned before that uh, he, he uh, ended up in despair over his own sins. And when he thought that there was no way of fighting the vice, he just declared that the vice is not a vice. He couldn't get rid of it, so he renamed, he rebaptized. He gave it a new name. He said, there is no way of getting rid of your sins, therefore go on and sin boldly. So once you're saved, you're saved. Yeah. And, uh, yes. Because uh, he had started to fight his own sins in the wrong way, from the very outstart, which I have explained, because uh, he uh, logically was therefore not able to win he did what many losers do. He changed the issue. That's something that happens every day in political discussions. You can't win the discussion, so you change the issue. You just start up with an issue where you think now you could win. It's like playing chess. You realize you've got some better man against you. You change the rules of chess. And uh, that's exactly what he did. Uh, before he became the real rebel, as I said in his sermons, then in the 95 Thesis, afterwards in open rebellion, he declared that there's only one way to get saved. Of course, you save yourself, needless to say, but the only way is sola fides, the faith alone. He called good works unnecessary to the point of saying that they are scandalous, a waste of time, he said, you can't be saved by just uh, whispering uh, your own filthiness into a priest's ear. That was his way of describing confession. And uh, he radically, short-tempered as he was, like a man who is uh, angry to the point of madness and who could commit any uh, unspeakable, uh, unimaginable crime right at the moment, he changed into a state of life that would remain such for the rest of his life. Not just one fit of anger, but one life of anger. And this is easily proven with his own words. He did not just call the Pope a rascal. He called him names. If I quote them to you, nobody will ever buy a Father Hess tape again. His favorite word was in English, S H I T. That in itself doesn't mean much. He would use it, however, on the most holy of subjects. One of his favorite words starts with the famous F, whatever at the time in Germany would be the correspondent word. One of his favorite uh, uh, many of his favorite uh, words would uh, describe parts of the human anatomy that are quite necessary for survival, but that are not exactly the most ideal subject for table talks. The language that Luther used, especially after the uh, real Reformation, I mean what's called the Reformation, which was called the deep formation really, was unbelievable. Many people who know Father Hess know that I'm not scrupulous as far as language is concerned. I'm not one of these people who uh, pale and uh, faint on hearing some things. Uh, to me it's impossible to read more than one paragraph of Luther at the same time. That's how disgusted I am the way he spoke. He would call the Pope names that I had to check in the dictionary. That's how filthy his language was. He would use terms that 
He used the language that you will find in the worst Hollywood movies. That was his everyday language. When somebody contradicted him, he'd be a fool, an idiot, a rascal, a criminal, to name the speakable words. Then he would call him uh, a part of the anatomy. Uh, this is a common term, also in this country. And he would use the F word, he would use the S word, he would use hundreds kind of words, some of them in itself innocent, but not if you use them for describing the papacy as such. I'm familiar with uh, the anger that somebody can feel on uh, things that are going on today, and I'm, I'm quite... Uh, I, I, I perfectly understand that when you're angry about somebody or something, that you will not exactly describe it with the most poetic words. He used these terms on the gospel, on the papacy, not just on the Pope, but on the papacy. And the result was that his theology was very much alike his own language. He would say, for example, it would be easier uh, let me get this right. He would say it would be much easier for a prostitute to be saved rather than for a monk. He didn't mean in the sense that the monk had to live up to his state of life, while the prostitute might have been an ignorant little uh, girl who never was taught the truth, never knew anything. No, on the contrary, he said by institution. He would call being a monk a greater sin than being a prostitute. He was not uh, satisfied with abandoning his own tradition, uh, with breaking his vows, uh, taking on a woman uh, as a monk, uh, ceasing to celebrate Mass, not frequenting the, the sacraments anymore. No, because he still had a conscience, he would tranquilize his conscience by declaring these very things immoral. He would tell you that you are bound to go to hell if you listen to the Pope. Mind you, that back then, when the Pope did never touch doctrine. He would tell you that there is no way you can escape hell if you become a monk. And of course, very soon he had those famous uh, words in English, Popish, Monkish, uh, Priestish. Nothing in the state of holiness would be good to him anymore. He would use the language of excrements for everything holy and sacred. The sacraments to him were human waste. Mind you, he didn't use that term. He used terms that I will not quote here. With his language degenerating to an incredible filth and an incredible baseness, so was his life. He not only, as I said, abandoned the sacraments, ceased to uh, frequent the sacraments, celebrate Mass, say the breviary. He said not even his prayers, not a slight touch of religious life in him anymore. Many years before he became what he was, that monster that split Christendom, he said, and I quote Martin Luther literally now, I cannot pray without cursing. Father, I have a question. Yeah. When did Luther become a Lutheran? When did he formally say that only by the Bible, we only have to go by the Bible? Who were the people behind him that pushed him into doing this? Um, they had meetings uh, uh, at the White Horse. Uh, yeah, but that's already three questions now. Wait. First of all, you asked me uh, when did he formally. Well, that was, of course, the 95 Thesis. Uh, but he's still a Catholic then. Uh, uh, not really, no. But but no. he considers himself no. a Catholic. Uh, uh, no. no, no. The point, no, 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 no. You have to see this in a different light. I told you that um, 
long before he published the 95 Theses, he already started to preach many of these issues. Now that's, uh, the moment you start to preach these things and your superiors tell you to, to stop it and you don't, you cease to be a Catholic. Uh, the, uh, the, the first question, uh, was Martin Luther, uh, when did he become a Lutheran? Well, in, in a certain sense, he never became a Lutheran because you could not possibly, that would be a, an, 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 an uh, un inexcusable, grave injustice. You cannot possibly say that the Lutherans are like Luther. That is, uh, that's grave injustice, as you will see. Uh, I've just come to the point where Luther said, uh, I cannot pray without cursing. You cannot say that your neighbor over there, who is a Lutheran, is not able to, is not capable of praying without cursing. Uh, cursing. Impossible, you can't say that. So in a certain sense, Martin Luther never was a Lutheran. All of his life he never was. What in the English language is understood under the term Lutheran? Impossible. Was Hitler a Nazi? I don't know. Hitler was Hitler, and Hitler said what he wanted, what he wanted to say, and what he believed, and he wasn't following anything. And here we come to your third question: Who were the people behind Luther? For the points, for so far, nobody. The devil. Luther said himself, "I draw my inspirations from the devil." His own quotation. Luther said himself. Many years before I started to leave the monastery, before I left the monastery, I had troubles every time I saw the crucifix or a statue of Our Lord or Our Lady. I couldn't even face a picture of Our Lord anymore. Why? Logically, because he had ended up in despair over the vices that because of his pride and disobedience he couldn't fight anymore. I mean successfully fight. So being oppressed by his co conscience, that was much less built by doctrine and learning than by scruples. Oppressed by this conscience, he couldn't face our Lord. It's like uh, you look at your, you look at in your at your inside, and you say to yourself, "Oh my God, what did I do?" And then you see a picture of a lady, and you look away. I can't even look at her the way I'm, the way I am. He, uh, when he, by the time he went public, everything he said was deeply ingrained in him. He had lost the faith, he had lost obedience, he had lost the fight. And he drew his inspirations from the devil. That's why I said, when you asked your questions, I cannot pray without cursing. What does he mean? He explains it himself in the table talks. He says, I cannot even say I cannot even say our Father, the Our Father anymore. I will say, Our Father who art in heaven, why don't you curse that damn Pope? Hallowed be thy name. Curse all the monks. That's the way he would pray. There's witnesses to this. The table talks are written tradition. The table talks, not church tradition, uh, written history. Uh, the table talks are written down. And very few Protestants have the courage to say these are not authentic, because we know they're authentic, and they know they're authentic. Don't ask me how they can stay Protestants once they read those table talks. That's something I cannot answer you on. It's not my, not my purpose to speak about But that. are these available? Yes, especially today with that funny little thing called uh, Internet. Yes, so and they would be called what, Father? The Weimar Table Talks, I said that. And, and the facts about Luther will give you the book I mentioned. Facts about Luther will give you the necessary sources. So, uh, when I consider that the uh, Youngstown in Ohio is not exactly what you call a big city, the uh, the library of Youngstown, Ohio, has one million books available, uh, and be it only on microfilm. We haven't touched the internet yet, so nobody could could tell me that he's not uh, able of getting these. Yes. Now, at some point, yeah. people start to follow follow Luther. Mm -hmm. It started to become a, an institution. It started to become its own religion. We come to that, but we have to come to that in the system. At this point, he is still a renegade, but he has not, not formed 
the new religion. Oh no no no, that's that's something even Luther couldn't do overnight. So that's so he's not a Protestant yet. Oh, of course he's. No a no Protestant no no, I, I mean that, but there's not a formal organization. No 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 no. Okay. No, now uh, that for that he uh, the devil gave him, as Luther himself said, two inspirations. The first one was to decry celibacy. He went to public and said, celibacy is a sin. As much as I am a man, as much as I cannot fly, as much as I cannot simply become something else, as much as I need a woman. And of course, that's what he did. Uh, he started to preach against uh, chastity, virginity, and celibacy. He said, uh, a man who is not, who has no woman is not a man. If you ask me about the John Wayne of church history, then I will not name somebody who was married, but St. Benedict. When God permitted that St. Benedict uh, had visible satanic apparitions that looked like beautiful girls, he threw himself in a thorn bush to get rid of the temptation. That's what I call a man. A man who gives in, who gives in to his own lusts and desires, that's not a man, that's a sissy. And, of course, in the logical context of Luther's own despair about his own vices, he, quote-unquote, had to do it. So, he met, of course, he met a few ladies, he had quite a few, uh, I call them ladies for, uh, but anyway, uh, women, women. He met a few, whatever. Uh, he met a few uh, uh, specimen of the female uh, human species, and uh, he had uh, recordedly uh, quite a few adventures with them. And uh, it is, uh, I, 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 I never read the Rainbow Press, so I'm not going to expand on the story on how he met Catherine Bora, uh, a nun, of course, who would become his wife. Uh, if you want to read about this, you will find books, but uh, it's not uh, the place and the time here to explain the rainbow press details of Luther's life. He wanted a woman, he got more than one. The point was now, you asked me, how did he get popular? Well, of course, that was one step. He explained that it is impossible to win your vices. He explained that it, uh, you do not need to fight sin. Go ahead and sin boldly, but believe even more boldly. I should say that with a southern accent, but that's polemical. He preached the breach of celibacy. That will always be popular with the people who can control themselves, obviously. So what happened was, by the time he had preached against celibacy, by the time he had declared that celibacy is against the will of God, many other people like him, monks, secular priests, even bishops, abandoned their state of life, grabbed the next girl they could lay hand on, and that was it. He became popular in parts of the clergy. He had yet, not yet reached anything uh, that could be compared to power, the power he would wield later on. He not only preached against celibacy, he would tell you, literally, the Ten Commandments are nothing that has come from God. He would talk about the cursed Jew named Moses, who oppressed his own people, inventing the Ten Commandments. He said the Ten Commandments do not come from God. God would never give us commandments that nobody can keep. Again, logic's here. He couldn't keep them, quote-unquote couldn't, he didn't want to. He gave up the fight. He wanted to get rid of his despair about his own conscience. So he declared the commandments null and void. 
The result was, with the fourth commandment gone, he became one of the major rebels in European history. He is the arch revolutionary of all revolutionaries. Liberté, égalité, fraternité, as the French proclaimed in 1789. Nothing new. Luther said it already. He instigated the uh, Peasants' War at the time, the Peasants' Rebellion, in his parts of Germany. By the time the peasants had lost, he put himself on the side of the princes and told the princes uh, to uh, punish the rebellious peasants in the most harsh possible way. Again, this is not rainbow pressy, and I'm not going to go details what happened, but it was horrible, horrible. Luther has not just gone down in history as the founder of a new religion or let alone a reformer, which he wasn't. He should go down into history as the one who instigated uh, war, rebellion, and slaughter, manslaughter in Germany. By abandoning the Ten Commandments, therefore abandoning the Fourth Commandment, he logically had to tell the peasants, who were sometimes justly angry at their princes, well, you do away with them. It is not good for a Christian to have a superior. A Christian knows himself what he is doing. Now, you see that? The pride of Luther. He didn't listen to his superiors when he needed to fight his own vices. He called himself to the priesthood. He called himself into the monastery. He decided what to do against the vices. He decided what penance he's going to do, when, where, and how. So now he decided that every Christian has to decide for himself. The faith alone will save you. But what is that faith? You read the Bible, you will read the Bible, and you will judge the Bible. And if you read the Bible, and you judge the Bible, what is it? You found your own religion. The essence of Protestantism, as you can see still today in the sheer amount of Protestant sects, is that Protestants basically form, each one forms his own religion. You read the Bible, and whatever the Bible tells you is what you're going to do. The old famous game, open the Bible somewhere, and you will find the answer on what to do next. Uh, that's uh, superstition. Moral theology has to tell you what to do, and your agenda has to tell you to do. What the duties you have to fulfill your agenda. And moral theology to decide what duty is really can really be a duty, and what duty is immoral, or might be immoral. That will decide what you do next. Maybe even a phone call will decide what you do next. But uh, to open up the Bible in any point of the Bible, read a line and decide what to do next or what to decide in your life, that's superstition. The Holy Spirit is not available to everyone at, ev ev to everyone at every hour. The Holy Spirit has guaranteed his inspiration to avoid errors if a pope pronounces infallibly. He hasn't guaranteed that to you or me. Luther, however, determined, was determined to make everybody decide on his own religion. He literally said, when one of the princes asked him and said, uh, or one of the fallen away priests asked him and said, ask the Herr Dr. Luther, please, will you, uh, why he says that such and such uh, uh, quotation in the Bible has to be interpreted in such and such a way. Where does he take his wisdom from? Luther had the messenger answer, tell him because I say so. That was the way of theological argument in Martin Luther. He deliberately falsified the translation of the Bible in order to adopt the Bible to his own thinking, not in order to prove his own thoughts in the Bible. That was only pretense. He will translate the Bible so the Bible would just say what he wanted the Bible to say. He used the Bible in order to prove his own errors. What specifically did he do to the Bible? There were books that he did not include in the Bible. Am I correct? Letter of St. James, for example, about oh. chastity. He condemned chastity, so he couldn't put in the letter of St. James 
that is very explicit on the purpose of chastity, virginity, and celibacy, as a matter of fact. It doesn't call it celibacy, but it had to go. That of St. James had to go. The letter of St. James said something that the Herr Dr. Luther was not in agreement with, so the letter of St. James couldn't have been inspired. Out it went. So he became God. Yeah. Every heretic is his own God. That's what I said about the sin of uh, Lucifer. Even Luther, though, he wasn't able to be like God. He wanted to be what he was out of his own sake. And the result was... Having instigated the rebellions, of course, now the whole thing became uh, a political issue with the Emperor uh, Charles V. You can read about all these historic happenings in excellent books and books that will tell you much more than I could ever remember. Um, how was it possible that he got popular? Simple. He told the local princes to confiscate churches. If you confiscate a church, with that building comes a lot of chalices, monstrances, reliquiers, uh, vestments, and money, donations, income. In those days, a church was not just a building used for the Sunday assembly. A church was the center of a whole community. It would have its income because some of the finest wines in Austria today are still in property of the local parish church. Vineyard, vineyards, I'm sorry, I should have said vineyards. Some of the finest wines in Austria come from wineries or vineyards that are still property of the local parish priest. So if I buy that bottle of wine, whatever they make on that bottle of wine will end up in that parish church. We can imagine in those days telling a local uh, prince that... Um, property is something to be condemned, seventh commandment goes out the window, that uh, no Christian needs authority, fourth com commandment goes out the window, and uh, then of course adding his own lies, eighth commandment goes out the window, uh, telling these princes that they were entitled to confiscate everything a monastery owned, meant money, lots of money. That was Luther's success. He himself said, by the time this whole thing was public all over Germany, he was one of the most hated men in Europe, which in those days meant in the whole world. He was one of the most hated personalities. Sometimes he would refuse to attend a very important conference because he was dead afraid of being seen in the streets. And he said to his beloved, uh, wonderful wife, Catherine Bora, the ex-nun, he said to her, if they can lay hand on me, they're going to kill me. His only hope was the protection of the princes that he had made rich by confiscating the goods and properties of the church. But let me return to the more spiritual things, because it's very important. In his interpretation of the Bible, he went to the point of absolutely unspeakable blasphemies. He took the point where Christ talks to Magdalene, called Christ a name that I cannot pronounce here. It has to do. It has something to do with a man who uh, does not mind of having many women. He called Christ that name. For those who want to know what he said, they can look it up in the dictionary. In the German language, the term is spelled H-U-R-E-N-B-O-C-K. He called Christ that name, and he added, I quote Luther, literally, table talks. Christ was that name, who fooled around with Magdalene. He accused the popes, of course, of things that not even Alexander VI would have ever done. Like he said, 
I am not able to pray without cursing. He lived. Can you imagine somebody not only indulging in uh, his sexual activities to a way that is most disgusting, to a point that is most disgusting, and indulging in all kinds of uh, food and delicacies, a man, a priest who drinks seven liters of wine every day, recorded. That's almost two gallons every day. To me, it's absolutely incomprehensible how somebody can survive that, or keep it, if you, might, if you know what I mean. He did. He didn't live, he didn't exactly live the life of a second Saint Paul, as uh, some Protestants call Luther. He cursed Christ. He cursed Our Lady. He cursed the virginity. He cursed the state of celibacy. He cursed the Pope, the papacy, the Catholic Church, the Mass, the sacraments. He said that he is receiving his inspirations from the devil. He claimed of having had apparitions from the devil. He said that uh, he only sometimes he only feels comfortable when he thinks about the devil instead of our Lord. He said to his so-called wife, with, his, with whom, of course, he lived in concubinage, he said, when one night, Catherine Bora, who was somewhat less guilty than he was, they were doing a late evening walk, and she said, isn't that sky beautiful? In German, the word sky and heaven is the same word, Himmel. So, in German, it would have sounded as if she had said, isn't that heaven beautiful? Luther looked at her gloomily and said, this is recorded, he admitted this later on. He looked at her gloomily and said, yes, Katie, but not for us. He knew where he was going to go. Knowing that, knowing that he had lost everything. He was asked, for example, Martin, do you really believe everything you teach? And he said, no. Who does? He knew he was lying. He knew he couldn't prove anything, he said. He destroyed the society in Germany. He was the one who created the Thirty Years' War, 1618 to 1648, one of the most cruel and disgusting wars in history, if you study the details. Incredible. He was long dead by then, but it was Protestants against Catholics. The whole Thirty Years' War was about that. Martin Luther, Martin Luther died the way he lived. On the evening of February 17th, 1648, he, as usual, of course, went to bed stone drunk. He was found in the early morning and contrary to some Protestant reports, there is other reports at the time that say they tried to revive him. He was found hanging on a rope in his bedroom. Martin, the great second Saint Paul, as some call him, Martin Luther, who destroyed Christendom in Germany, who lived like what he called Christ. Look up that word in the dictionary who lived lying, cheating, cursing, who substituted prayer with curse, celibacy with filth, who substituted any kind of virtue with any kind of vice, died in despair. Satanists always die in despair. He died hanging himself. He took the rope, hanged himself, and went to hell. I mentioned that in 1974 there was the first attempt to have Martin Luther canonized. I cannot give you any verification for what I'm accounting now. I cannot give you any proof. If you choose to reject what I say now, you're free to do so. I have it from a very, very reliable source. Now, I mentioned before that in 1974 there were some people already who tried to have Martin Luther canonized. 
the story I'm going to tell you now is very short, and uh, I have absolutely no proof. I cannot in any way uh, make you believe what I'm going to tell you. However, I have it from a very reliable source, otherwise I wouldn't waste your time in telling you this story. In 1974, a priest uh, in the Austrian province of Styria, which is one of the nine Austrian provinces, near to the capital of that province, Graz, you can look it up at the map, started to publish uh, a series of articles explaining to you many things that I have explained to you today. And uh, some sinister forces that I don't want to go into uh, started to uh, decided to make that man shut up. So they went to see him and told him, you are not going to interfere with our movement to have Martin Luther canonized. That priest said, okay, I agree with you, but I want you to stay here until tonight. That's the only condition I ask. The priest went into intensive prayer, grabbed his book of exorcisms, and after many hours of prayer, many hours of exorcism, many hours of intensive concentration on the point, that man went back to the room where these people impatiently were waiting for him. And he sat down with them. That's all he did. And there was a knock on the door. These people said, come in. Nothing happened. The priest said, come in. The door opened. It was a glowing red, charcoal glowing red, Martin Luther chained between two demons. These men never asked again that these articles cease to be published. The priest finished the series of articles, and these are the source of my information today. He, however, if the story is true with this priest, or if it is not true, he wrote his articles quoting reliable historical sources. The church usually does not go into details if somebody's in hell or not. If you read just that one book, Facts About Luther, and if you only believe 50% of what I said today, then you only get a glimpse at that monster called Martin Luther, who destroyed to do it, who tried to destroy Christians.